Oh, hi there. This is Liv just popping into your listening experience to tell you, or remind you, that I have got another book coming out. Nectar of the Gods is not only a book of 75 Greek mythology-themed cocktails, but it's also the nerdiest, silliest book of obscure myth and history facts and anecdotes nestled alongside some incredibly tasty cocktail recipes. Pre-order Nectar of the Gods by me, Liv Albert, wherever you get your books. Hello, hello, hello. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I, I am Liv, your host and person who loves to obsessively research myths, sometimes to a fault. Hey, remember the old days of the podcast when I used to just do the bare minimum research? Bit of Wikipedia here, one myth retelling book by a man there. Ah, the old days. How I cringe. Grateful for them and the listeners that still love those days, but man, how I cringe now. And I still get reviews that are like, OMG, this woman just cannot research to save her life, and I just want to scream back at them. But I digress. Today is a very good example of the lesser research I used to do, because today I am revisiting the single acknowledged official heroine of ancient Greece, Atalanta. Now, I've covered Atalanta's story before, and not even in the earliest days of this podcast, but still, the comparison between then and now in terms of my research abilities and my love for a detailed retelling are miles apart. Atalanta had a mini-myth, a mini-myth, for the number one heroine of ancient Greece. What a fucking travesty. Thus, here we are, in the tail end of Women's History Month, looking back at Atalanta and what makes... Her the single acknowledged official ancient Greek heroine? Maybe not the only one? Because Atalanta deserves it. When I originally shared the story of Atalanta, I shared her most famous anecdotes, moments from her life. But in fact, this heroine of Greek myth appears in many places, in many forms, over many, many generations. Today, we're looking at her from across the Greek world and across time. But mostly we're looking at Atalanta as not just Atalanta, but the Atalantas. Because Atalanta was born in Arcadia, or she was born in Boeotia. See, there are two stories of Atalanta from these two different regions, maybe even two distinct Atalantas, heroines of Greek mythology. First, a brief geography lesson. I won't go into detail on these two regions that claim Atalanta as their own, Boeotia and Arcadia. I will just explain the most important thing. They are not that close to each other. These regions are not neighbors. They weren't sharing stories because of their close proximity or shared heritage. They are actually pretty far away from each other as far as mainland Greece is concerned. Arcadia is in the middle of the Peloponnesian Peninsula, and Boeotia is north of Attica. In the past, when I've read about this, looked at it at a glance, my assumption was that these were just two regions that wanted to claim this heroine. She did impressive things, she was a strong woman with a unique story, which we'll get to, and they both wanted to say that she was theirs. That seems the easiest solution, and it's certainly one that fits with the wider world of Greek myth, the way these things operated. Heracles, after all, is a hero of so, so, so many locations because everyone wanted to claim him in some way. He's from Thebes, he's from Tyrans, he's from Trachis. So why not the same for Atalanta? Well, backstory, and her story in general, suggests that maybe, just maybe, this wasn't a case of two regions wanting to claim this woman, but in fact, two heroines. Two notable women doing notable things, both named Atalanta. And these women maybe got molded together over time. This actually serves to strengthen the story of one of them and make the other a different sort, interesting all the same. And Atalanta, by the way, means of equal strength. 
I want to believe it means specifically of equal strength with men, and my beloved Theoi.com says that's possible, that perhaps it was a reference to all the success she, or they, had against men. And credit where it's due, the reason I'm going to look at these two distinct ideas of Atalanta, tell their stories as two distinct women, is because of the set of books Early Greek Myths by Timothy Gantz. Ugh, he examines the sources and has compelling arguments for separating these two. Plus, it really adds to the stories. But I won't give it all away just yet. This is episode 160, Independent, Industrious, Badass, and Brave, the Heroine of Ancient Greek Myth, Arcadian Atalanta. Today is about the first Atalanta, the Arcadian Atalanta who was born to a man named Iasos and a woman named Clymene. Iasos was the son of the king of Arcadia, Lycorgos, but he wasn't the firstborn. Regardless of his own status, Iasos wanted a boy. We don't know why he wanted a boy, but we can certainly infer. This bit of Atalanta's story, her birth and origins, are basically only told in the work by Pseudo-Apollodorus, a man who was fairly late in the period and who was really deeply brief. I always forget who it was on Twitter that I saw call him the TLDR of Greek myth, but it's just so accurate. Still, he's often the only source we have for stories because though he was brief in the stories themselves, he was thorough in the number that he covered in his library of Greek myth. But he was also biased by his time, which we'll get to. Iasos wants a son, and so when his wife, Clymene, gives birth to a daughter, instead he turns to Greek mythology's most troubling tradition. He exposes the baby on a mountainside. Specifically, says the ancient source Elian, a mountain called Parthenion. This is important because, well, it means virgin. Now, Iasos may not have directly exposed his daughter or he had someone do it, but according to some, he actually specifically gave the baby to someone to straight up kill, not just expose, and that person was instead the one who exposed Atalanta instead. You know, just to be nice, I guess. <laughs> now, just a note that I did specifically say this was Greek mythology's most troubling tradition not actual ancient Greece, there's been some interesting scholarship recently about what the Greeks actually did and did not do with their babies, mostly in reference to disabled children. And the basic answer is they did not routinely expose them or have them killed. Still, when it comes to their myths, it's the perfect plot device. It serves to solidify a child's parentage, like Atalanta as the daughter of Iasos and Clymene, while also giving them a more intense backstory and a will to survive. It makes the children more interesting, stronger, complex. It's really just a good narrative device to move the story along and put characters where they need to be. Because in the case of Atalanta, that she is exposed on this mountainside, left to the elements and the wild animals, is exactly what makes her who she is. Atalanta, as this baby left on a hillside, is not killed by the elements, she's not eaten or maimed by wild animals. No, she is found by a mother bear and taken in. Here we get details from other sources. Atalanta was found not only by a mother bear, but a mother bear whose babies had been killed by hunters. The bear was full of milk and had the instinct to help and feed babies, and so when she came upon the baby Atalanta, her instincts took over. She fed and cared for Atalanta, but the same hunters who had killed her babies kept watch over her, and eventually the hunters snuck in and stole Atalanta away. Which is a great way to explain how Atalanta then found herself with humans once more, but oh my god, this poor mother bear. It's even sadder in the source, but I can't deal with sad animal stories. 
Still, Atalanta is now being raised by humans once more, but she has this wild origin, being suckled and fed, cared for by a mother bear. This is what makes her special. As she grows up out in the woods under the care of hunters, she unsurprisingly takes a liking to Artemis. She begins to live her life like the goddess, determining that she doesn't want to marry, doesn't want a man, and as the translations will tell you, she remained a virgin. But as I will remind you, again, what that means in the ancient world is it doesn't mean she didn't have sex or that she didn't love women or women and men or no one at all. It just means she didn't marry. The stories won't tell of sex because it wasn't part of her narrative. But like Artemis, you can take from Atalanta what you want. You might even re-listen to an episode from last year's Pride Month where I spoke with Julie Levy about potentially an aromantic or asexual characters in Greek mythology. Atalanta among them. Atalanta lived in the wild, established herself as a talented hunter, an independent and happy woman. The source that gives us details is a man named Elian. Not one I come across often. He's a late source, like 1st or 2nd century CE, and primarily concerned with history, but he seems to speak a lot about Atalanta, and I love it. Elian describes where she lives when she's grown up, where she lives, it seems, all alone. And it's so beautiful. I want to share some of it, so this is a slightly altered and abridged quote from Elian. Atalanta lived in a large and very deep cave, at the entrance protected by a sheer drop. Ivy encircled it, the ivy gently twined itself around trees and climbed up them. Crocuses grew, and hyacinths and flowers of many other colors. There were many laurels, their evergreen leaves so agreeable to look at, and vines with their luxuriant clusters of grapes flourished in front of the cave as proof of Atalanta's industry. A continuous stream of water ran by, it flowed in generous and lavish quantity. The spot was full of charm and suggested the dwelling of a dignified and chaste maiden. Atalanta slept on the skins of animals caught in the hunt, she lived on their meat and drank water, she wore simple clothes in a style that did not fall short of Artemis's example. She claimed the goddess as her model both in this and in her wish to remain a virgin. She was very fleet of foot, and no wild animal or man with designs on her could have easily escaped her. And when she wanted to escape, no one could have caught her. Atalanta was living the dream. After Elian describes where Atalanta lives in the depths of a mountain cave that sounds like an actual dream home, he goes on to describe her appearance. And if Atalanta isn't Elian's manic pixie dream girl, then I don't know what she is. I don't want to focus on her appearance because guess what? Doesn't matter. But Elian's notes on her are wild. He talks about her being strong and masculine, that she exercises all the time and her body is banging. He then describes her hair and complexion and makes such a point of saying it's all natural and none of it comes about by any feminine wiles. No, no trickery here. She's born with it. It is a long and detailed description of a woman who literally could never be real, but he is describing her not as a mythological ideal, but as a real woman who basically put all others to shame. Like he literally says that exposure to the sun made it look like she was always blushing and that... What's sexier than a woman raised to be modest? Ew. Still, it truly doesn't matter what she looked like. What matters was that she was so fucking cool. Pausanias, who traveled around the Greek world and liked to find things that he could attribute to mythological backstories, says that there's a stream there in Arcadia that they say sprung from the earth when Atalanta, thirsty from her hunt, struck the ground with her spear. From the spot burst the spring, giving her and anyone else the fresh drinking water that they needed. 
I'm sorry, but a woman in ancient Greece and Greek mythology who was breastfed and cared by a bear and then raised in a mountain cave that looks like a plantstagram dream home, who does what she wants, who can hit the ground and cause a spring to appear, who wears what she wants, associates with who she wants, and hunts and runs around the woods like the goddess Artemis, Atalanta is the absolute fucking coolest. But... Well, this is Greek mythology, so obviously there's going to be a downside to this story of a strong and independent woman living her best life. The first sign of trouble for Atalanta, but the one she dealt with easily, was when she was attacked by two centaurs. They came upon her in the night. They'd plotted to find her to assault her. They were her neighbors, living in the same woods as Atalanta and stalking her like creepy half-horse serial killers. But she could not be snuck up upon. She would not be taken easily. She sensed them or saw them or heard them immediately. And in a split second, she had shot them both through with her arrows, killing them both dead. Which should lead us and everyone hearing Atalanta's story to question how and why she could then be so famously taken down by a fucking golden apple? Well, we'll get there. That might not be her fate after all. Atalanta has proved her worth among hunters and heroes, so when the opportunity for further heroism comes along, Atalanta is included among the list of heroes set to partake. There's two instances of this, one much more detailed than the other. First, the quest for the Golden Fleece. Atalanta is sometimes among the heroes called upon to go in search of the Golden Fleece, far off to the east in that place we all know so well after all these years, Colchis. And it's led by the man who we all love to hate, not quite the worst, but a very close second, Jason. But interestingly, sometimes Atalanta is allowed on the Argo, and sometimes she isn't. Apollonius, the most famous author of the quest for the Golden Fleece, the man who wrote the epic, the Argonautica, that I've read on the podcast, he doesn't allow Atalanta on board. In fact, quite specifically, she is not allowed. She is called upon, yes, and then she really, really, really wants to go. But apparently Jason thinks it will cause trouble to have a woman on board. Someone's going to fall in love with her. (laughs) It just can't be. Thanks, Jason. Meanwhile, in the versions by Apollodorus, she's listed among the men. There are very few details of her inclusion, but we know that she was there. And honestly, that's cool enough. Still, what detail we do have is that at the funeral games for Peleus, that's Peleas with an A, the man who'd set them on the quest for the fleece in the first place, not Peleus with an E, who she wrestled at these funeral games and who is Achilles' father. And not only did she wrestle Peleus, but she won. Still, the most famous story of Atalanta's heroism, the reason she gets to be included amongst the list of ancient Greek heroes, is, of course, the famed Caledonian boar hunt. While Atalanta is off living her absolute best life in Arcadia, there's a familiar king in Caledon who's causing himself some grief. Aeneas, the king of Caledon and father of none other than our newest favorite woman, Dianera. He had forgotten to thank Artemis. Artemis specifically, in his sacrifice in thanks for a recent harvest. And, well, we all know the gods are a petty bunch. Artemis gets angry with Aeneas for this, and, in response, she sends a boar to terrorize Caledon. Now, the boar of ancient Greece are much, much scarier than you might imagine. For one, wild boar in general are supremely dangerous, even if I, as a West Coast Canadian, see them mostly as large and angry swine. 
If I've learned anything from playing endless amounts of Assassin's Creed Odyssey, though, it's that these boar are super dangerous and can do a hell of a lot of damage. And that Caledonian boar is not just any terrible ancient boar, but one sent by the goddess of the wild, goddess of the hunt, Artemis. So needless to say, it's going to be a tricky beast to kill. Knowing this, the king of Caledon, Dianera's dad, sends out for the heroes of Greece. According to Apollodorus, the heroes that assemble in Caledon upon Aeneas's call are as follows. First, Aeneas's own son and brother to Dianera, whose name might have caused you to wonder in those recent Trachinii episodes, Meliager. Yes, the brother of Dianera is this same Meliager of Atalanta's story. Then, Drias, a son of Ares, Idas and Lyncaeus from Messene, Castor and Polyduces from Sparta, Theseus, yes, ugh, Theseus from Athens, Admetos from Phiri, and Caius and Cepheus from Arcadia, Jason, ugh, yes, Jason from Iolcus, Iphicles from Thebes, Pirithous from Larissa, Peleus from Phythia, yes, Achilles' dad, who she wrestled, Telamon from Salamis, and finally, our girl, Atalanta from Arcadia. Heroes from all over the Greek world, far and wide, travel to Caledon in response for Aeneas' call to in defeating this boar that's ravaging his region. Now, like the quest of the Argonauts, there are variations on who traveled to Caledon, depending on your sources. But frankly, I much prefer this version, where Atalanta is about to specifically be more impressive than people like Peleus, father of Achilles, and Theseus, and his even more horrible friend Pirithous, and even Jason. It's much, much more satisfying than versions with less memorable names attached. Aeneas, who, by the way, it's just hard, his name is spelled O-I-N-E-U-S, it doesn't matter. He gathers the heroes together, Atalanta included, and he hosts them for a week of feasting and celebration before they then go out in search of the Caledonian boar. But during this time, there's a couple of men who take issue with the fact that they are expected to hunt the boar alongside, ugh, ew, gross, a woman. The horror. Still, there's a man who is willing to stand up for Atalanta and tell the guys to suck it, to just accept that they will be hunting alongside her. Aeneas' own son, Dianera's brother, Meliager. Except, according to Apollodorus, Meliager does this explicitly because he not only wants to have sex with Atalanta, but very specifically he wants her to have his baby. And also, he already has a wife who's already given him babies. Nice guy. Definitely gave him way too much credit when I first told Atalanta's story. Serves me right to think there's examples of halfway decent dudes in Greek myth. Still, after this partying and feasting and hosting by Aeneas, the heroes head out to hunt the boar. And for details on this bit, we will turn now to my man Ovid, who is really the only one who gives us details on the hunt itself. That the hunt took place is clear from much, much earlier sources, mythology, pottery, but they don't describe it in detail. We just know there was a Caledonian boar hunt, and it was hunted by these heroes, Atalanta was involved, and ultimately the boar was indeed hunted. Ovid, though, tells us how it happened. Off the group went deep into the woods of Caledon, where they know the boar is raging. Quote, There this band of valiant heroes went, eager to slay the dreaded enemy. Some spread the nets and some let loose the dogs. Some traced the wild spore of the monster's hoofs. They're using their hunting skills. Ovid really emphasizes this. They're not all just rushing in with spears held high. They're being strategic. They're going about it as hunters, devotees of Artemis, rather than just busting in. And finally, in a deep gorge, covered in brush, they find the boar. Or rather, the boar found them. Their hunting skills did them little good in the end, and the boar was disturbed by the sound of them. It came at rushing out of the brush in a mad dash. Quote, 
The young men raised a shout, leveled their spears, and brandished their keen weapons, but the boar rushed onward through the yelping dogs and scattered them with deadly, sidelong stroke. It's not looking good for these men searching for the boar. But thankfully, they're not all men. The Caledonian boar has finally revealed itself in the most dramatic of fashions by busting in on this group of men who thought they were sneaking up on it. It scatters them with this deadly blow, sending bodies flying. But among these scattered men, these flying bodies, was not Atalanta. She does, though, finally catch sight of the boar when it takes out these men. She sees it. But she isn't startled, she doesn't get scattered by it. She sees the creature, raises her bow and arrow high in the air, aims carefully, and lets loose an arrow. She hit the boar square in the head, hitting it by the ear and staining its bristles with blood. But she doesn't kill it. As all of us Odyssey players know, it takes more than just one arrow to take down the Caledonian boar. Still, Ovid tells us that Atalanta was happy with her shot, proud of herself for being the first of all of them to actually hit the beast, to wound it, to thus make it easier to kill. But even the woman who made the shot isn't happier than Meliager. He is weirdly psyched about it. You think it's just him being supportive, like a feminist, wanting to get her the credit. That's certainly the take I read on it when I first told you this story. But looking at the sources themselves... No. Meliager's a weirdo. He's excited because he wants to impress her, wants her to like him. And I mean, maybe he legitimately likes her, it's nice, he's attracted to her strength and her skills, but if we take Apollodorus' version, he's already married with children. So we don't actually need to like Meliager, even though he's supporting her. He's got weird and gross ulterior motives. And Ovid tells us very clearly that he rejoices in Atalanta's shot, even more than she does. But, of course, not all the men are thrilled that it was Atalanta, a woman, who first took aim and actually wounded the Caledonian boar. And in the head, no less. She hit it in the head. No, a few of them are actually pretty fucking angry about it. It doesn't help that Meliager starts yelling about it, telling them not only to look at what the woman did, but look at what the unmarried woman did. Actually, in Meliager's defense, I've had to refer to another translation for a future line, and my usual go-to translation, the Mendelbaum, has him instead saying just, quote, It's only right that you receive the honor due such signal bravery. So, okay, that's just nice. Regardless of how Meliager handles it, this first wounding by Atalanta, a woman, well, it doesn't go over well. Surprise, surprise. One of the men who doesn't want Atalanta to win any of their masculine glory, Ancaius, yells out, quote, Witness it. See the weapons of a man excel a woman's. Ho, oh, make way for my achievement. Let Artemis shield the brute. Despite her utmost effort, my right hand shall slaughter him. <laughs> it's the make way for my achievement that really gets me. In the other translation, the Mendelbaum, he's equally obnoxious, saying, quote, Young men, make way for me. It's time you learned that nothing women wield will ever match a weapon that is wielded by a man. And then, well, then Ancaius gets ripped to fucking shreds. I'm thinking Artemis, of all fucking people, didn't love a man calling out to her to help and then saying he's going to prove that women fucking suck at hunting. Like, read the fucking room, Ancaius. And Caius's death scene is so good, I want to quote it for you. This is the moment, the moment after he's boasted. Quote, So mighty in his boast he puffed himself, and lifting with both hands his double-edged axe, he stood erect, on tiptoe fiercely bold. The savage boar caught him and ripped his tusks through his groin, a spot where death is sure. 
and Caius fell, and his torn entrails and his crimson blood stained the fair verdure of the spot with death. <laughs> so when Caius is very dead, and as much as someone's death shouldn't be funny, this one kind of is. And after this, in further attempts to kill the boar, Peleus throws his spear and seemingly accidentally hits and kills a guy named Eurytion. Things are not going well for the men. With Ancaius dead mere moments after he boasted about himself, and Peleus having killed Eurytion with his very poor aim, Meliager now takes aim at the Caledonian boar. He takes aim and throws his spear, and he misses, because he's no Atalanta. But he takes aim again and he throws again, and this time he hits the boar through its side, hard enough that the animal is wounded, slowed down, enough that Meliager can rush up to it and stab it through once more, finally killing the beast. Having finally killed this creature, the rest of the men rush to it and also begin to stab it. it sounds like a bit over the top, they're full of adrenaline and looking to show off their power to make it very clear that the men have done the deed. But Meliager, either because he isn't such a shitty guy, or because he wants to sleep with Atalanta behind his wife's back, steps up. And when the Caledonian boar's hide is removed from its body, he hands the bloodied, bristled mess to Atalanta, saying it deserves to be hers because she dealt the first blow. We get no word of Atalanta's reaction to any of this. It's as if she kind of falls to the wayside, both in terms of the telling of the story, but also maybe because it just doesn't matter whether she cared or not. She knows she hit the creature first, that her arrow hit him on her first try, piercing the beast below the ear, almost certainly affecting its ability to keep fighting. Does she care if she gets the credit? If she gets this boar's hide? Maybe she does, maybe she doesn't, maybe she's above that type of more obvious credit. What matters is that the men of the group are fucking infuriated that Meliager would even consider handing it to her. They are absolutely unwilling to concede any credit to a woman, to give any suggestions that a woman did any damage to the animal, that she contributed even a tiny bit. They are obvious in their disgust that a woman was even allowed to take part. They are certainly not going to give her any credit for it. So are we surprised that in some versions, Jason and Theseus and Pirithous are among these men? I think not. Reminder, Pirithous is the guy who tried to abduct Persephone from the fucking underworld. He's less important, but equally awful. They're fighting over the hide, their refusal to let Meliager hand it over to Atalanta gets vicious and violent, with Meliager not giving in to their anger, to the point where Meliager actually kills two of them. Unfortunately, not Jason or Theseus or even Pirithous. He gets to die strapped to a chair in the underworld, or rather live there forever unable to move. <sighs> no, Meliager kills two brothers, his own uncles, named Plexippus and Toxius in Ovid's telling. And for this, you all might remember, Meliager himself is killed. But not by the men there, not in immediate revenge for this murder. No, his own mother, Althea, kills him by tossing a bit of wood on the fire. A bit of wood that she knew would be the death of her son, that she had in her possession just in case. Today's episode is not about Meliager, but the quick recap is that He'd been cursed. The wood had been thrown on the fire, and his mother had been told that when it had finished burning, he would die. She'd fished it out at the time and kept it safe, hopefully not ever intending to burn it and kill her son. But that's exactly what she did when Meliager killed his uncles, her brothers, picking his possibly creepy crush on Atalanta over his own family. What of Atalanta after the death of the boar? What of this Arcadian Atalanta? We don't know much about the moments after the boar's death, or even how she handled Meliager's eagerness to help her, his death. Her own contributions aren't really mentioned. Of this Arcadian Atalanta, we learn that she eventually does eventually marry a man, or at least have a child. But 
The man she married may not have tricked her, may not have married her through cowardice, through a gross act of manipulation, through the story that we know of Atalanta. This incredible heroine who lived so independently, who was so strong and skilled, who defeated Peleus with her strength in wrestling, who'd taken one shot at the boar and hit it square in the head, this Atalanta may not have been the same Atalanta from the famed story of the Golden Apples, a story that makes so little sense given everything we know about the Arcadian Atalanta. But that is for next week. Oh, nerds, thank you all so much for listening, as always. Did I set out to turn this story that I'd originally told in a mini-myth into a two-part episode where I talk about two different Atalantas? Absolutely not. But here we are. 2022 live versus 2019 live. What a difference. (laughs) So there's this one quote I found from Xenophon, a 4th century BCE writer who has a piece called On Hunting. I couldn't figure out the best way to fit it into the episode, but I still wanted to share it. So, quote, For all men who have loved hunting have been good. And not men only, but those women also to whom the goddess Artemis has given this blessing, Atalanta and Procris, and others like them. I just love that. It's a good example of how we, myself very much included, tend to generalize the understanding of women in the ancient world around the idea of Athenian women, because that's most of our sourcing. But it gives a false notion that all women had to lead these stifled, locked away kind of lives, when that really isn't the case. So here's Xenophon being like, oh yeah, women can not only be hunters, but they can enjoy it and be good at it when they're gifted by Artemis. It's kind of nice. And... Oh, hey, look, I've remembered to read another of your amazing reviews on the show. I read all of them that come in. I get emails with them every day. But somehow, every time I'm putting together a script, I forget that I should add one in. Fortunately, recently somebody tweeted at me after I'd read their review, and they were so psyched that it motivated me to do it again. So this is from Allison YVR from Canada. (sighs) One of my favorite podcasts. It starts five stars. Liv, the host, is enthusiastic and knowledgeable on the subject and adds a dose of humor as well as a willingness to point out where the mythology is especially weird or horrifying. Lately, the content has broadened from simply telling a myth to entertaining conversations with experts and deep dives into specific myths and heroes. A great choice if you are interested in mythology and don't know where to start, or if you're already a huge nerd and want to learn more. Thank you, Allison of Vancouver. I love to hear from a local, and it really means a lot, especially when people are recognizing the growth of this show. So please join Allison in sharing your love for the podcast. It truly means the whole world to me, even if I forget to read your reviews on the actual show. I read everyone and smile every time because you are all so fucking awesome. Let's Talk About Myths Navy is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and handles so many podcast-related things. Gosh, just everything. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am Liv, and I love this shit. (laughs) 